everyone, and uh, welcome to all the Bruins in the house. The uh, Bruins Professionals Annual All Chapter Meeting. I'm Mike Anderson, co-founder and acting executive vice president of Bruins Professionals. And as we get underway this morning, I'd like to introduce a few individuals. Joe Wingard, our current president, and for organizing today, Katherine Dickerson. Katherine, where are you? Kate Fletcher. Kate, you're right here. Nick Theodoro, is, is Nick here? He's on vacation. Okay. Okay. Just back to him. Okay. And Sabrina Gutierrez. Sabrina? Thank you. I'd like to now uh, introduce Julie Sinai, Associate Vice Chancellor of Alumni Affairs and Advancement and CFO of the UCLA Foundation. Hey, Julie! Thank you so much. Good morning, Bruins. Good morning. Good morning. First, welcome home. We are so pleased that you chose the Alumni Center to meet at this morning. And we hope that you visit us often. One of the things I encourage you to do is take a walk around. We are trying to really make this place feel like a home, feel like a living room. And so when you're on campus doing business, visiting, don't just stop by. This is your home. It's your living room. Have a cup of coffee, have some refreshments. We hope to see you often. The other thing, that I, a couple other things I want to mention is, one of the things that we have really appreciated this year is a strengthening of our partnership between our alumni association and group professionals. One of the things that we hear most often from our alumni is really a desire to be more connected around the career life journey. Uh, both are working with our students as soon as they graduate, as well as our alumni who come back, as many of you do, to work in or serve in our mentoring programs, to participate in the interview with the Bruin. Uh, but also to continue to have career conversations. So the partnership we have with career professionals is essential to really the broadening of that work. One of the other goals that we have this year that we're doing in partnership with career professionals is we would love to have a ruin owned business directory. So you all are helping us with that, and one thing will lead to another, so thank you for that as well. The last thing that I'd like to mention is that this is the first year under the leadership of Chancellor Block, that we are going to say to all of our students upon gradua gra graduation, <laughs> got to work on that, got two or three more weeks to work on that, graduation, welcome to the Alumni Association. You're automatically a member. Everybody's a member of the Alumni Association. Yay. First in the UC to do that. So when we also talk about the UCLA rankings, we just went from 91,000 members in the Alumni Association to 418,000. <laughs> the other thing that we're doing is we're shifting to a model that we also have two tiers beyond that membership: an annual membership with a blue level and a gold level. And also for the first time, you have a choice. You can choose to do that, that uh, branch up at either one of those levels by donating to UCLA alumni scholarships. So alumni legacy, that's huge. Again, first in UC to do that, we think that's gonna move the needle for us. So welcome home. We are so grateful for our partnership with Room Professionals, and we hope to see you often. Thank you so much. but formally has been the, he was the founding chairman of three companies, 
uh, Rexford, APP Partners, and of course, Art and Realty, which uh, was one of the biggest, the biggest uh, real estate holder with over 20 million rentable square feet here in Southern California before its uh, merger with GE, $5 billion, not, you know, small news, uh, back in uh, about 10 years ago. So, uh, kind of a big deal in the real estate space, but also on, on campuses across this great city of ours. Uh, he did all of this great work despite earning a couple of degrees from, uh, from SC. And what I found out, the, the only way that you can actually get out of that school and accomplish anything in your life is to do it in a big way. So he wasn't just an attendee of you know, getting his undergrad and getting his JD there. He was literally Mr. Trojanality. <laughs> that was his title. He was the president of his class over there. So we got to forgive him for that. We also, here at UCLA, gave, gave him three honorary, honorary doctorates. Um, so, you know, three degrees here, two there. I think, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as if this, you know, professional and educational pedigree isn't enough, uh, the reason why, you know, I think everyone is, is really excited to hear from Richard and, and knows his name even more is because of his philanthropic contributions. He's a chairman of the board, he was a chairman of the board at City of Hope, um, on the board of governors at, and I need to really read notes here because there's a lot, uh, board of governors at uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, co-trustee and CEO of the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation, um, of course, famously here on the UCLA campus. campus. He's the namesake of our Zyman Center up at the uh, up at the Anderson campus. So any Anderson alums saw his name every day. Um, and he also is involved in the Alzheimer, Alzheimer's Hospice at the LA Jewish Home for the Aging. So, and there's probably an even longer list, but he certainly understands uh, what it's like to be a Bruin and that mix of, uh, of giving back to the community that has you know, supported him, and we are really, really excited to have him here. I have to also tell you that uh, he has a personal life when he's not, you know, filling this bio with all of these incredible things. Him and his wife May um, travel extensively. They have four kids, uh, and, and it's not the kind of travel that I do on a regular basis. Uh, for example, he's headed up to Jakarta for business very shortly, and you know, he's going to do a hop over to Bali to do some types of fishing. <laughs> So he has an, a lot of interesting stories, and we're really excited for him to impart some of that great wisdom on us this morning. So let's give him a round of applause. Let's, let's sit for here. Is, is the mic on? Can you hear me all right? Back in the back, can you hear me? No. Come on now. <coughs> no? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Raise your hand. Uh, let me set the record straight. Uh, it's not three degrees from UCLA, but four degrees. To illustrate my commitment to UCLA, I am the recipient, I think it was 2006, 7, or 8, of the gold medal at UCLA, which is UCLA's highest award. And something I'm very thankful for, quite honestly. I have been committed here at UCLA since the 80s, and so I've turned my back, literally. Uh, to USC during my first year of law school because of a situation that happened there and they never remedied it. They say they've tried for years and years and years, but that doesn't matter what they did. But nevertheless, I am a true groom. True groom, I have two seats on the wood. And I'm only the True groom, true groom, I've got a suite, which is for the benefit of the real estate center, on the 50 yard line, lowest level. At the Rose Bowl. <laughs> if you go into Pauly Pavilion and you want to buy sweatshirts, t-shirts, or whatever it is in the store there, you'll see right outside. And true group. Um, UCLA Zion Center, I'm giving you a little bit of a little bit of boost. UCLA Zion Center was actually in down and started uh, 13, 14 years ago, 2001, just before 9 11 the morning of 9 11. The morning of 9 11. The morning of 9 11 was the announcement of the creation and establishment of the center 
in the LA Times on the front page in the lower in the lower section, lower section of the front page. But on the morning of 9-11, no one read anything about the center. No one even knew it existed. But today, in 14 years, quite honestly, the center, I believe, and many, many believe that it is the finest real estate center throughout the country and therefore the finest real estate center in the world. And it's not just at Anderson. It's not just in connection with business. It's also connected with the very closely connected with law school. It's very involves the school of public uh, policy, it involves the engineering, architecture. So it's it's almost campus wide. Uh, it's if you talk to a number of students at Anderson, why have they come to Anderson? One of the reasons they come is because of their deep interest in real estate. We teach a number of classes. What's happened in the last 14 years is we have Higher schedule of classes and research and publications and panels and all kinds of activities related to real estate, real estate related aspects of the, of the business itself. So, a plug for, oh, by the way, we're in the midst, as we all know, UCLA is in the midst of a $4.2 billion capital campaign. So, Anderson just had a $100 million uh, commitment from Marion Anderson. I hope you all read about that. Uh, the result of which Anderson is part of the $4.2 raised their commitment to raise in the capital campaign from 175 to 300 million dollars. And the Zyman Center itself, just as a center, uh, is committed to raise our endowment from approximately 8 million dollars to 20 million dollars. And right now it is the best endowed, but still inadequately endowed center in the country. So enough about that. And by the way, we're going to have a great football team this year. <laughs> He's great with the students and athletes. He's terrific in terms of his intensity, his knowledge, and the lengths at which he'll go to really <coughs> have a prominent moment for the world. I would not I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to rank close to the top ten coming out of the box and then the season for the bottom of the Real estate. What was my topic for today? So <laughs> 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 where I put it off? But does anyone know? Um, but I know I'm Okay, the unknown world of real estate. Um, real estate, someone told me a couple of weeks ago that one in three people are involved directly and indirectly in the business of real estate. I think that's an overstatement, but it sort of tells you what's going on out there. Everything is real estate. Uh, the, the, the Zyman Center itself really wants to employ everyone in this big program of real estate. The streets are real estate, the university is real estate. Where you live, where you work, where you get hospitals, everything is real estate. Everything we touch every day we're on real estate. And what, how that real estate is used. We tend to look at only the commercial aspects of real estate. We look at the homes, how we can finance, and by the way, I'll talk about interest rates. You have to take a look at the commercial aspects of real estate, how many people it does employ, from the people who construction, finance, those that lease it, those that sell it, those that manage it, those that operate it, and every other aspect, those that trade it on the New York Stock Exchange. Real estate is no longer a cottage industry. It's archaic in many ways. You still have to record a deed or a deed of trust or mortgage in some county office. Very archaic. You don't have to do that anywhere else. Yes, cars, but now you don't even get a pink slip anymore. But you do get a recorded deed in real estate. So real estate uh, is archaic, but it's all consuming, it's all around us. And it is a very sophisticated, complex industry today. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, public company real estates, total assets for approximately $4 billion, those being traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Today, those being traded on the New York and over-the-counter stock exchanges is well over a trillion dollars. So we're seeing the public ownership of real estate take over. But what is that public? It's everyone. I'm the chairman and uh, 
uh, founding chairman of Rexford Industrial Realty. REXR is the symbol on the New York Stock Exchange. You can go and buy 210 or don't buy 200. Well, you can buy 200,000, but don't sell it shares control <laughs> the market. But you can buy and sell and trade as well as you know real estate companies today just like any other, just like General Motors. And until the early 90s, it really wasn't true. It took a great recession for the whole structure of public real estate companies to take hold when the guys were going broke and they needed something for having access to capital and Wall Street came up with this idea of the public upreit, R-E-I-T, real estate investment structure, which had been around since Eisenhower in the, uh, uh, in the 50, 1950s. But it didn't really take hold, as I said, until the very early 90s, when a slew of big companies who were going broke, needed to deleverage, needed to have access to capital. Wall Street came up with this tax-free way in which they could put their properties into a public format or a to be public format, go out, raise the capital, pay down their debt, and survive for another day. And survive they did. Simon Properties, the largest REIT in the world, the largest publicly traded real estate company in the world, was one of those companies. Still here today. Still many others are still here today. There are over 250, I believe, New York Stock Exchange real estate companies. There are I can't remember how many in the S&P 500 and how many are in the S&P 50 today. Ten years ago, we had zero in the S&P 50. What does that mean? That means it's the true instant instu institutionalization of ownership of real estate. We didn't have that before. We had guys like you guys like you sitting out here that owned high-rise office buildings. They still do, but nothing like the, today. Um, you have now the institutions that own, and those institutions are public real estate companies, they're pension funds, insurance companies, offshore companies. That's who own the big real estate today. Uh, you still have the New York families, and you have certain families here, but slowly the size and the, and the percentage of ownership of real estate, whether it's industrial, I'll get to the industrial particularly, Office, apartments, shopping centers, strip centers, uh, healthcare facilities, these are all being coming institutionally owned on a broad scale. And they're very expensive. When I bought my first industrial building at the age of 25, it was the rule of 10, 10, 10, and 10. It was $10 a foot, land and building. It was 10% down, 10% interest, and 10 year long. Okay. Today, that same building, is a hundred dollars a foot. So you can see what's happened to the appreciation of real estate. Real estate is also a unique, and for many people in the room, I'm not telling you anything, it's a unique thing. Every single piece of real estate, whether it's an apartment building, an office building, or a shopping center, is a business. It's a business you can, as an individual, you can buy it. And you can go out and you can get a conventional loan or sometimes even a non-conventional loan for 60, 70 percent of the acquisition cost. A non-participating partner for 60 to 70 percent. It's tough to buy any other business on those terms. And most of those loans, once they're, the, they're built, is non-recourse. There's no personal liability. You can take that as it appreciates and trade it tax-free into more real estate and grow and, grow and refinance. And re I mean, these low interest rates keep refinancing. And before you know it, one good buy can turn into, one building can turn into four or five and six, and you have to pay the nickel and tax. And you've spread your risk, and you've got four or five assets appreciating for you. That's the beauty of real estate. Very, very unique. And the 1031 aspect, uh, gets attacked all the time in Congress. They want to get rid of it. They want to get rid of it. And maybe sooner or later they will get rid of it. But it's not happening right now. And it depends upon, obviously, uh, which political bent is in uh, the House, in the House and the Senate, and as well as the White House. So that's that's going to have a big issue. That is going to be a big issue coming forward. Um, and there's other issues regarding real estate from the tax point of view. Let's go back to particular real estate. And let's let's touch apartments. 
and such office buildings, industrial and shopping centers. This is an end healthcare. And as I said earlier, big, big chunks of these are publicly owned. Where they're management intensive, generally they are, pub they are owned by active investors as opposed to passive. A passive investor would be a pension fund, insurance company, and the like. If they do own, they'll own it in connection with an active investor who will put some money in, usually very little, and then manage and operate. So these, these pieces of real estate, apartments, let's say apartments, apartments are selling, can't buy them. No one wants to sell them, which I don't understand why, when you can sell them at you know, three and a half and four percent capitalization rates. Why, why not sell? Wait for another day. These capitalization rates, the returns on your investment cannot low, cannot be compressed anymore. A little bit here and a little bit there, but they just can't be compressed anymore. And a lot of this compression has come from cheap interest rates. When you can borrow for 10 years, interest only, at three and a half to four and a quarter percent, four and a half percent, more people want to buy. Because they figure 10 years, there'll be a whole different market, lots of appreciation along the way, and a big chunk of the investment cost, the loan, is fixed for 10 years and doesn't participate in appreciation. So that has compressed and caused values to go up. That's one. And there's no doubt about it, although a lot of the uh, federal regulators will argue not. Second thing is there's a tremendous amount of money in the system. We've never seen money like this chasing real estate ever. You have the public companies that are generally 35 to 60 percent leveraged. And they have access to debt and access to capital like they've never had before. You have, <clears throat> you have a lot of banks, insurance companies that have loosened up, uh, loan the values have gone up. The availability of non-recourse financing has gone up dramatically. And so you have a lot of just conventional, usual money in the system. On top of that, we have other fundraising, capital raising vehicles. We have, as I said, private pub publicly traded companies have come so far into the market and raised so much money and had such inroads, they're a big force. But private REITs, how many of you know about private REITs here? Okay, private REITs are non-traded. They're out there raising money through broker-dealer uh, relationships. And they're raising, some of these REI, private REITs are raising money at the rate of a million dollars a day, two million, three million dollars a day. It's a huge industry. And many of the buildings you see, you think are owned by the usual institutions. And public real estate companies are traded. No, they're owned by the private REITs. It's a huge sector. It's not a trillion dollars, but it's, it's probably 150 to 300 billion dollars. So it's, it, and that really didn't exist at the level uh, in the last 10 years. So you have an enormous amount of capital that's being raised in increments of 5, 10, 15, 20, 25,000 dollars. And you have thousands of investors in these, thousands, literally tens of thousands of investors in some of these private banks. Then you have crowdfunding. Who's heard of that? Ah, more have heard about crowdfunding than you've heard about private REITs. That's because of the internet. Simple as that. Look at the impact the internet has. There was, crowdfunding didn't even exist three years ago, two years ago. And it's legitimate. There's rules and regulations specified by the SEC and by the Department of Treasury and others. And if you follow those rules, which are going to be tightened because there's going to be a lot of abuses, Crowdfunding's going on, it's increasing like this. Private REITs are increasing like this. Public REITs are increasing like this. So all of this capital is coming into those vehicles. Now let's put on top of that our conventional sources of, real, of, uh, of capital. You have pension funds. You have CalPERS. I don't know how big they are now. 400 billion, 450 billion. CalPERS used to have 3% in real estate. Then they went to five. And they went to seven. Now, let's say they're nine or ten percent. You have CalPERS and CalSTRS between the two of them, they're probably 700, 750 billion dollars. And then they leverage, and so that's 75 billion dollars at 10%. Let's do some easy math. 
leverage it at 50%, that's $15 billion in real estate, where it used to be four or five billion. Take the uh, pension fund of uh, Norway, largest pension fund in the world, almost a trillion dollars. Five years ago, not a dime in real estate. Now their target is 5%. 5% of a trillion dollars is $50 billion. Again, we leverage it at 50%. That's $100 billion going into real estate. Five years ago, it wasn't going in at all. And you have the pension funds, the international pension funds that have reached out, like South Korea is a big investor. Japan is a big investor. These are pension funds, not companies. On top of it, we have lots of other institutional investors that never existed before. We have the German institutions that have now come into the marketplace. You have the sovereign funds that didn't invest in real estate except for trophy buildings in Manhattan or London. Now they're investing everywhere. You have Abu Dhabi that's everywhere. Qatar is everywhere. Uh, Kuwait. So you have it out of Saudi Arabia, although they're quieter than most. Uh, and you have them throughout the world now. They're, they're buying, even in their own backyards, they're buying in Singapore. Then you have big, big sovereign funds of Singapore and CIC out of uh, China. Uh, sovereign, the, the, the sovereign fund of Singapore has invested billions and billions of dollars in real estate. They just bought from one, I'll get to private equity, from one private equity company, they just bought one portfolio of 120 million square feet of industrial space in the United States, Singapore. And very quiet deal. It was obviously to real estate professionals, it was there. It was called Incor, Blackstone was the seller, and uh, Singapore was the buyer. So you have those kinds of, now we haven't seen the great influx of capital from the big, big institutions in China. All these headlines you've seen by and large public companies, or what I would call top tier, but the lower end of the top tier of the big institutions coming out of China. China Life, the biggest life insurance company in China, has really not made a major investment in the United States, nor has the seven or eight below them. AN, I forget the name of it, let's call it AN Life. Just you may have heard, two billion, almost $2 billion for the Waldorf Astoria in New York. They're the 10th largest insurance company. Number nine, down to number one, haven't really done anything. CIC, the Sovereign Investment Fund of China, has theoretically allocated $250 billion to real estate. Theoretically, they haven't appreciably invested in the United States. Yes, London. Yes, uh, uh, Western uh, Europe, yes, uh, Australia, but not here in the United States. What's that gonna do to our prices when all of this starts going? Then we have what's called flight capital. We all heard about that. The dollar strong. The euro is weakened. People don't understand the economies of Europe and what's maybe going on there. They don't understand the economies of really everywhere in the world. Look what's happened to the Australian economy with uh, China going on, but even China. So the strongest economy still, and the strongest currency is still the U.S. dollar and the United States and the U.S. dollar. They're coming here. They're coming here. And for those that have U.S. dollars offshore, they want to repatriate them here rather than anywhere else. Or if they can find some good deals. We're now finding, the, and let me get to the private equity funds in a minute, but you're now finding private equity funds. They can't, they can't get the yields that they want here. So where do they go? They're going to where there's problems. They're going to India, where there's growth going on. They're going to Western Europe. There are still bargains. And we know what's going on in Greece, and Italy has still has its problems. Spain's not out of it yet. Ireland pretty well is. And, and when you look at, how should I say, it's astounding that our 10-year is at 2%, 2 and a quarter percent. It runs around a little bit. But the, the German 10-year is under 1%, the Japanese 10 years over under 1%. Why are they buying all of ours? Because it's the strongest. This is where they want to be. And once they buy it, they have dollars, they'll probably use, convert them and use them, again, to invest in real estate. So let's go to private equity funds. 
Private equity funds are worth, are a vehicle through which many of these institutions that I've enumerated that are buying real estate also invest because they don't have access, they don't have the expertise to manage, operate, and acquire, and then ultimately sell these assets. <coughs> so private equity funds have grown dramatically over the last 15 years, dramatically. Blackstone itself, the largest, 300 billion under management. Uh, private, well, there's bigger, there's bigger, but I'm talking about true private equity firms. Uh, you have BlackRock, four and a half trillion under management. Trillion. Uh, right here in our own backyard, the capital group, uh, almost a trillion and a half under management. These are enormous amounts of money to have available. Uh, traditionally, a lot, a lot of this private equity funds were never invested in real estate. Now, Blackstone just completed raising a fund of 14.5 or 14.8 billion dollars dedicated to real estate. They're the largest real estate investor in America right now, which is amazing. So all of this capital influx, low interest rates, has led to the most unbelievable real estate market we've ever seen. Whereas you can go back to 2008 and 2009, it's one of the worst, it was a debacle. A complete debacle. But because all of these private REITs were around, public REITs were around, and these private equity funds were around, we came out of it faster and bootstrapped itself and this influx of funds to really create the values there today. It's not uncommon to see that it was announced this morning. SO Green's buying single office building for $2.6 billion. One office building in New York. Uh, if, you, uh, if you took the Pan Am building, which is incidentally owned by, supposedly owned by Donald Brand, the airline company, four million square feet, who knows what that's worth? Four billion dollars? Three billion dollars? It's amazing numbers. Thousand dollars a foot. You've got apartments renting in New York at four or five thousand dollars a month. It's, it's, the, the rental rates are six, seven, eight dollars a foot. That's per month, so a thousand square foot apartment, seven thousand dollars a month, you can imagine. Now it's the high end, but that also affects and bootstraps up the low end all the way through the market other than rent control. So tremendous capital influx. Let's go now to a certain degree, real estate by real estate type sector. Start with office buildings. If you're mainstream, you're core, you're prime, you're a trophy, you're a hero. And they just seem to be changing hands. Look at high rises down here in Wilshire Boulevard. Most desirable real estate in the country is in San Francisco, in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Well, as a, as a larger uh, market. And these buildings sell at historically very high prices per square foot, very low capitalization rate, very low return on investment. Because everyone wants them that have so much disposable capital, you've got office buildings, I think they're going to be trading in the three and a half percent cap rates. Three and a half returns, office buildings. They're management intensive, they're extremely capital intensive. The tenant moves out, you have downtime, no income. The tenant moves out, you have new tenant improvements, you have leasing commissions, and you have capital improvements, maybe you got to redo lobbies, redo elevators, redo air conditioning. Very capital intensive, but if they're core and they're they're, they look good, especially on a picture, because I, you know, I think all these buildings are great, and they're also sort of like this. I'm going to say this, and I, I mean it. It's sort of, it's sort of like a phallic symbol. <laughs> I think some of these foreign investors think it really is, because they want nice picture. I'm dealing with a Chinese group today, very big Chinese group, and I can't, I can't nail them down, except on one thing. If it looks good, it's tall, and it's core. It's New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Forget everything else. That's one thing they know they'll buy, and there are no, oh, and they, many of them will not get into bidding wars, auctions. Today, when those kinds of properties are sold, you have an East Hill Security, you have a CBRE, you have a Christian and Wayfield, or, or, or Jones Lane, or JLL, handle literally a very quiet, very private auction. And there's usually one, two, or three rounds. And then you have to do your, quote, best and final. 
And then the politicking goes on, and the back room goes on, and then someone gets their card raised and they won the bidding war. The Chinese don't like bidding wars, uh, unless they're private companies, the, I mean public companies. The private companies do not like bidding wars because they don't like to lose. Uh, the Chinese also, different than the, China, different than the Japanese, want to be very heavily involved in the operation, ownership of the real estate. They want their companies involved. So you'll see a China Life come in and a CIC come in, but they'll, they'll partner with a Chinese real estate development company who will put up some money, but they'll put up the big chunk of the money and they'll come in and do it. That we're going to see a big wave of. And like, unlike the Japanese, the Japanese just bulldozed and came in here, paid, paid enormous prices, and applied their own rules as to how to own and operate and manage real estate, whereas the Chinese are not. They, they learn very fast. They know that real estate is a very local, local product, and therefore has to be run how we run real estate, not how they would run real estate in Shanghai or Beijing. So we have all these capital sources changing. And office buildings, as I said, capital intensive, but they like them, and they like them a lot. And there's, there's all kinds of office buildings. There's a high rise on Wilshire Core Core. There's downtown Los Angeles, beautiful buildings. You call them core, but they're not core core. They'll pay high rates, but no one, no one is convinced the downtown market until relatively recently has life and, and uh, meat on the bones, so to speak. Um, suburban office buildings. <laughs> you talk to the institutions, they kind of believe that it's the death knell for suburban office buildings. So, when you hear something sells for $1,000 a foot, $1,200 a foot, it's not a suburban building. Even though it's a beautiful building and it's perfect, but if it's you know, in Van Nuys or if it's, and even though it's in wherever it may be in, uh, in Torrance, they just don't sell $200 a foot, $300 a foot, $350 a foot, depending on what it is and where it is. So suburban office buildings, and they have the same issues that the core office buildings do, tenant improvements, leasing commissions in downtown. And everyone wants creative space today. So look at the conversion. Think about an office space of five years ago, 10 years ago. New tenant moves in, he doesn't want all those divisions, and no glass, and not open areas. So huge uh, commitment. But the rents in the suburban areas don't justify that commitment. So it's sort of a, it's a, it's a friction, non-starter, starter, non-starter. You say to yourself, all those people moving to downtown LA, living in all those apartments and condominiums, they're gonna have children one day. So children need schools and all the other amenities. Downtown doesn't have school and all those other amenities. May get some private schools, but it's not gonna be enough. So they're all gonna gravitate to the suburbs again, suburban office buildings. And we know what the traffic's like today, and this is gonna get better unless Santa Monica stops issuing building permits. Then we get better um, if you live on the west side. So, so suburban office buildings are what they are. Apartments, everyone thinks they're the casting out. The government through Freddie and Fannie or HUD will finance these things forever at the cheapest interest rates forever with amortization that can be anywhere from 25 to 40 years. Um, and everyone wants apartments because everyone believes that rents are only going to go one way. And uh, if you're a believer in that, then it gets wait, 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 but ultimately the bubble is going to burst. Uh, buildings going on, you can only push rent so far. Uh, rents used to be 25% of your net after tax income, and it was 30, and it's 35. I think uh, the Zion Center came out with a statistic, in many cases, over 50% is your rent cost. You can't tolerate that long. I don't know how long you can. And if they are, in many cases, 50%. You can't raise your rents that far. So apartments, uh, they're great to own, uh, but they're not going to be the earner uh, increasing yield. Two ways you make, make money in real estate is internal growth and external growth. Internal growth is just increasing rents, increasing occupancy. External growth is you develop or you buy. Some public companies big public companies are focused on internal growth. And the markets they're in 
are constrained for them, especially the public companies, to buy because of this high competition. The yields are so low, they're not what's called accretive. They're dilutive. They're not beneficial to a public company. So many of these public companies, in those marketplaces where there's this huge capital influx, can't grow except by increasing rental rates or increasing occupancy. When you get to 95% occupancy in an office building or apartment, you're there. You're not going to do much better, maybe 96. So the only chance you have is increasing rental rates. And that's why it's going to be a big push on rental rates for many of these public companies that own apartments. And a lot of these apartment buildings around here are owned by public companies. Um, shopping centers. Um, if you listen to the statistics, uh, listen to the, the regional shopping centers, the super regionals, they're going to be fine. Uh, all this death metal of the internet, now it's only enhancing business. Uh, sales per square foot are really out. Bang, 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 bang. We'll see. We'll see. That's the school sale still on that one. Uh, strip centers, uh, regional centers, uh, it depends on where it is, what it is, uh, but of the third tier, fourth tier, and fifth tier centers, uh, everyone thinks they will cease to exist and they'll be ultimately scraped and they'll, for a higher and better use. So shopping centers, uh, right now, because the consumers there, although I just heard on the way in here that consumer spending was down and Walmart did not meet its expectations when it reported its earnings uh, and, reven and revenues. And Walmart is really the bellwether of what's happening in retail and consumer America. It's the element. Uh, so that's an indicator. Uh, let's go to industrial, industrial real estate. Um, Southern California is the largest industrial real estate market in the world outside of China. Believe it or not, we have 2.1, 2.2 billion square feet of industrial space. You fly into LA, if you look down on either side of the plane, you'll see acres and blocks and blocks and blocks of industrial buildings. Southern California is the largest manufacturing hub in the United States. Two of the largest ports, the two largest ports in the country. Uh, we're the center for entertainment, media. We have more high-tech jobs in Southern California than there are in Silicon Valley. We have the most diversified economy in the world. And it's all here. And we're seeing industrial, it breaks down into two categories. And let's use Southern California as an example. We call it the infill and the non-infill. Non-infill is basically the Inland Empire going, and that, by the way, that can go all the way to Las Vegas. <laughs> so there's unlimited land. The infill is this side of Ontario, let's say, Ontario West. The infill, there's no more land available. Here and there, you'll see industrial building breaks through. There's no more land. In fact, in the last 10 years, maybe as much as 50 or maybe as much as 100 million feet have been lost in the infill areas. Why? It's been scraped for higher and better uses. Schools, parks, apartments, retail, whatever it may be. So we're actually losing net industrial space in Southern California at a time where demand right now is at an all-time high. Because the internet, the internet has changed. Rexford Industrial has 11 million square feet of industrial real estate. We were the biggest buyer in Southern California last year, and, we, and since we were public uh, less than two years ago, we've doubled the size of the portfolio. 11 million feet, but uh, we have 1,100 tenants. That means our average tenant is 10,000 feet. It's nothing. It's like an office space tenant. Art and Realty that I took public in 96 and grew to 20 million feet. As an office building company, 20 million feet, our average tenant was 7,000 feet. We had 3,000 tenants in 20 million square feet. So you have an office tenant. Industrial it doesn't make sense because everyone thinks big box, you know, a million square feet, half a million square feet. Southern California is the home to the small business. We don't have big, huge, major businesses here anymore. Aerospace is gone. Boeing just shut down uh, the uh, C-17 production line. Last big production facility here in Southern California. So, so we are having, we have all of this diversity and all of this demand. So in industrial real estate, there's only really one way for rents opening up, barring a massive recession, and that's up. 
And so the most difficult thing is, again, here's the difference. Of that 2.1 billion square feet, less than 4% is owned by the public companies. Why? Because by and large, of these 2 billion square feet, there are 10. So tens of thousands of buildings that are 50,000, 40,000, 30,000, 100,000 feet. And it takes an awful lot of those buildings to make up uh, 2.1 billion feet. And those buildings are owned by anyone and everyone. Anyone, it used to be in the old days, the immigrants wanted to have apartments. They want to have a few units, they used to call it. Now it's not so much apartments, because they price, but they want and they keep industrial buildings. And they don't sell them. They don't sell them for the simple reason is they think the easiest thing, put in family partnerships, and therefore disguise uh, true values at the time of death. The easiest thing is to pass on to their kids, because they're the least management intensive, to a certain degree, but it takes a certain degree of expertise. Much less management intensive than an office building, than retail, than apartments. Um, that you can have third party people handle the management and leasing on a relatively easy basis compared to other real estate types and sectors. So there's a big demand for industrial real estate from all sectors. There's public companies, Prologis, the biggest. They have over 500 million square feet throughout the world. Uh, uh, Ed Roski, uh, I forget the name of his company right now, he's got 120 million square feet privately owned, 80 million of which is in Southern California. And in talking with Ed, he's got less than 500 tenants in 120 million feet, and we've got 1,100 tenants in 11 million feet. So go figure. But what, who's in there? A lot of internet, a lot of former office users. We buy 200,000 wood buildings, and we'll carve them up into 10,000 uh, spaces, or 4,000, 11,000, because we're small businesses, I said. Those users are internet. They have glass in the front, they park in the front, easy parking, it's included, they don't have to pay extra for it. They come in, there's maybe a little showroom, then some offices, maybe a little assembly area, then a shipping and, and storage area, and then roll up doors in the back, where FedEx comes and picks it up. And it's all over Southern California. In every kind of business you can imagine. Businesses that used to be in office buildings aren't. Uh, that's why, to a certain degree, unless you're on the west side or in certain other small, smaller office sectors, office locations, your, your occupancy is 80%, 85%. And now Torrance is getting crushed because first Toyota moved out. And then I just saw someone else, I can't remember right now, who is also moving out of Torrance. So rents in Torrance, I don't even know how you re-rent those buildings because there's so much competition for a tenant coming into a really vacant marketplace. And the rents are going to be cheap, but yet the tenant improvements still cost the same. And tenant improvement are going up daily. Construction costs are going up daily. So what do I portend for the future? Um, uh, cheap interest rates for a while. They're not going to last forever. Uh, but with so much cheap interest rates throughout the world, and with our economy really not taking off, it really is not taking off. And there's some statistics you'll see in the journal probably tomorrow, uh, where, where our GNP growth just isn't there. So I don't see the Fed raising rates significantly at all. They, they may raise them a smidgen just to raise them, but that's OK. That's not going to have an impact. Um, buying power, or the ability to buy, with more money coming into the real estate sector, I just don't see it. I don't see it. Prices going down. They can't go down much for more. They can't get much higher, but they can stay where they are. So we're going to start seeing less and less product because those who bought will settle in, and those that can't are unwilling to accept the yield. They're going to go elsewhere. Of Western Europe, they're going to go to India, maybe even back to China, uh, and to other areas. Um, a lot of it also depends upon what happens, not, not politically, but what if we had a huge terrorism event in this country? What's the impact on real estate? And the impact on it? What if that huge event is in a series of four or five uh, regional malls on the same day? Think about the impact. 
Think about the impact on the regional malls business, all the regional malls business, guilt by association. So, very hard to predict, but it's, it's the most, how would I say, under-leveraged, capitalist, capital stable I've seen in the real estate industry in my entire career. So these are okay times. Nothing can really hurt it that bad, other than, you know, obviously, an earthquake that really is a huge impact in Southern California or elsewhere. Uh, even New York has earthquakes, but so. Uh, barring what I call a black swan event, and from a real estate perspective, I see it just going right along very nicely. Uh, we'll see occupancies increase because the economy is getting better, perceptibly, but almost imperceptibly better. And we'll see higher occupancies. We're going to see higher rental rates in various sectors because of the demand that's going on in San Francisco. San Francisco, every other month, the rents are up. Office rents, apartment rents, you name it. Healthcare. Healthcare is eating up space like crazy, whether it's for taking care of healthcare patients, uh, whether it's home offices, whether it's, and then there's all of the private healthcare of labs and research and everything, huge. We're going to see office buildings converted to lab space. It's one of the logical uses for some of these suburban office buildings. Uh, and you have the corn shell. It's just you have to spend 150 to $250 a foot to create lab space. Very, very expensive, as UCLA knows. So we'll call them great times. I'll call them good, steady times for real estate ahead. I don't, you know, there's this old saying in real estate. If you have good health and live for 20 years, and you bought your first year, and you've got long, strong fingernails, and you can hang on <laughs> through the peaks and valleys, in the end, you're rich. <laughs> so there's, there's a scintilla of truth to that. But, but today, real estate's much more sophisticated, much more complex. And it's just not that simple. I mean, look at the environmental environment. Well, look, look at the drought. What's, what impact is a drought going to have on real estate? It's going to be huge. Every city is going to enact, especially in Southern California, is going to enact new regulations regarding buildings, existing buildings. You're going to have to capture all this water. You're going to have to treat this water. You're going to have to do that. We don't even know what those regulations are. And the cost per square foot can be prohibitive. And that's got to be passed on in rents. So those kinds of things are going to impact real estate. And they're going to impact homes, building homes. The cost of homes are going to go up. And that's just as a result of the drought. When we've got other environmental considerations uh, in terms and utility consumption and, and all the carbon aspects. So it's a changing environment, but uh, the only certain thing is life has changed. For that, I don't know if we have time for questions, do we? We do? We have about five, five to seven minutes for questions. Questions? No questions, so I covered everything, huh? <laughs> Over here in front. Uh, you mentioned uh, private equity funds like Blackstone getting into the uh, industrial real estate business. Uh, what are the prospects of that? Are they going to be able to Okay, the typical private equity fund, the investor in a typical private equity fund, are other institutions, high net worth in what's called family offices, and other sovereign uh, funds. So as I said earlier, as you said, Blackstone just raised $14.5 billion. That fund probably has a basic life of seven years. And they may have two, they may have three options, one-year options to extend. So let's call it a 10-year life. So we know for sure at the end of 10 years, they have to sell. Now, who do they sell to? Well, let's use Hilton as an example. Blackstone bought Hilton, took it private. Looked like the most horrendous mistake. The world came to an end in 2007, 2008. And Hilton, I think they paid, let's call it $23 billion. And it had, went down to maybe 15. Well, they had staying power. And they went to their lenders, and they worked out everything. And today, Hilton is being talked about as one of the greatest real estate deals in the history, because it's the first three rules of everything, timing, timing, and timing. It's when you make a lot of your money in the buy, and you can time your sell, so you can look like a hero, as long as you can hang on. So who's Blackstone going to sell to? 
It's real simple. What do they do with Hilton? They took it public. Hilton's on the New York Stock Exchange. What did they do with two other hotel companies that weren't Hilton's? Took them public. What did they do with a big chunk of office space they had in Silicon Valley in Northern California? They traded it into a public company called the Hudson Properties in a three and a half billion dollar transaction. Who owns public? Who owns Hill? Who owns um, these public real estate companies? Eighty to eighty-five percent of them are institutionally owned. Fifteen percent are owned by the public, the real public. Now, those institutionally owned, remember, are pension funds who have millions and millions of beneficiaries. So that's you know, the, there's a myriad of ways, and they can they, they'll sell to other private equity firms, or they'll go in the open market, and the Chinese will outbid the Germans, will outbid the English, or will outbid a domestic pension fund. That's what will happen. But likely, in private hands, except for another private equity fund, unlikely. Next generation. And they're buying homes for the next generation. They're buying them in trusts and renting them out in the interim. OK. But, and that's going on much more so in commercial real estate and much more so in industrial real estate, but not in uh, management intensive. So it's a whole new thing that I've only heard in the last uh, year, year and a half. But single families, if you live in West LA, they ain't getting more of it. it I, I don't care. And, and here, you have families, wealthy families. They want their kids. Quite honestly, they don't want their kids living in Manhattan Beach where it takes 50 or 60 minutes to do it. They don't want their kids living in the San Fernando. They want their kids living 10 minutes away, 15 minutes away. So they're going to buy them homes in West LA. If they live in West LA, they're going to buy a home in West LA. Manhattan Beach, come on, doesn't get much better, does it? <laughs> All right? You got Silicon Beach squashing the values in Manhattan Beach upwards. So it's location again. The market's going to be good. Housing starts aren't what they should be, but the housing starts are all not in the necessary area, low and moderate income. Uh, we're getting devastated. We don't realize, unless you go. I, as she said earlier, uh, that I'm a, a trustee of the Gilbert Foundation. We fund a lot of programs in the inner city. And on Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings, uh, we go down and have meetings in South Central. It's tough during the day, the week of business and everything else. You go into some of these homes now. These how many people are living in a three-bedroom, 1,200-square-foot home? How many families? It's shocking. And there's apartments in West LA, in West LA, in Culver City, where you go in in a two-bedroom apartment, and except for one area and access to the bathroom, it's wall-to-wall -wall mattresses on the floor. And who's living there? It's all these people who work in West LA who live way down there, but they can't afford to travel back and forth, or they can't get back and forth because it's so time consuming. So housing, we're not building enough affordable housing. I mean, our firemen, our policemen, they can't even live in the communities they serve here. So housing is a, the Los Angeles Business Council, which I'm also has these programs for affordable housing, getting behind it. The mayor in Los Angeles is an example. Eric Garcetti is, is got, he wants to build how many millions, a program of how many millions of affordable housing. Downtown Los Angeles would look as that potential affordable housing. Look what's happened. You got stuff selling down there, six, seven hundred bucks a foot, eight hundred bucks a foot, downtown LA. And when you look at downtown LA, three or four years now, when a bunch of these high-rise apartments and condominiums are finished, it's going to look different. It's not going to be affordable. They don't want that there. I'll be honest with you. So the government's going to have to get involved. They're going to have to hype up these government programs. HUD's going to have to really get back into business. And the cities and the counties are going to have to do it. The federal government, just we all know what goes on there. So in order for it to happen, it's got to happen at a local level. It has to happen at a local level, and it's it's difficult. But as far as you know, single-family homes in the San Fernando Valley, I, I just don't see those values. You know, Black Swan event, yes. Uh, some kind of Wall Street Black Swan event, yes. But you know, it's not going to last long. Everything gets fixed and rebuilt, or whatever it may be. Black Swan events, time passes, time heals all wounds, hopefully, uh, and. 
so I, I think single families, you know, if you're way out, those homes aren't being built. Uh, if they were built, some of them were scraped. By, by tens of thousands of them were scraped or left in a half-finished state. But I think housing is, is a good, single-family housing is a good bet. I think all those people living downtown, not all, a lot of those people living downtown, they're going to go to the suburbs. They're going to go looking where the schools are, where there's less crime, where there's less this, where there's less that. And as the subway gets built, we're going to have a little better access. Yes? Would you kindly share your thoughts about transportation and how it may have effects on Los Angeles and in, in perhaps opinions about transportation in, in relation to the low-income housing and how parking is such a component to development of larger... Well, that's, that's a whole boring question. <laughs> but, uh, right. Well, it's, just, it's not going to get better. Traffic is not going to get better. Uh, you have more people crammed into more areas. I mean, look at all the constructions going on just west of the 405. Uh, all the apartments, those people have to get to and from work. We don't have true rapid transit here yet. It's a long time to where it's really going to be effective. And how effective is one line going from downtown all the way to, uh, to the beach? How, how effective is one line? It's going to help. But look, we spent $2.6 billion, or whatever it was, on the 405. Did it really help traffic? <laughs> huh? Did it really help traffic? And, you know, maybe what they really have to do, ultimately, is deck these freeways. Now, like one, someone told me they're now studying to burrow under the freeways <laughs> and put another freeway under there. I can't imagine how long that's going to take and how, what that's going to cost. Yes, you, you know, when you build an office building, if it's office, you got to build two cars per thousand. Of, and if it's medical, it's five cars per thousand. Uh, if it's apartments or condominiums, you have to have so many apartments for so many bedrooms. I mean, so many parking spaces. So, yeah, these are all requirements, and they're not going to get better uh, in, the, in the near term. And it's expensive to build parking. It's expensive to have all these alternatives. Now, these hubs that they're building, where they're building subway openings, Generally, they're building uh, high-rise or very high-density housing around them. But in La Cienic and Wilshire, where there's going to be a big subway access point on the northeast corner, I know because the property is owned by the foundation being condemned, there's not going to be any high-rise apartments there. There's, there's just no, no, they can't afford it. They did it in Wilshire and Vermont. They did it in several other places in the valley. There it's concentrated, so theoretically people can walk, take the elevator down, walk some, or drive some and park, and go, where are they gonna park at La Cienic and Wilshire? So it's, it, the, the transportation, <coughs> our last mayor, it was one of the big, when I sort of threw my lot in with him after Bob Hertzberg didn't make the runoff, I said, I said, transportation. He still believes that the greatest thing he brought to Los Angeles is transportation. He brought the subway growth, he brought the trains, the, the green line, blue line, pink line. And he thinks that resolves the transportation. He thinks that he did the best he could and no one could do any better. And I don't agree with that. But I don't have an answer for such a long, as far as affordable housing, it's where the land is. Who's going to subsidize it? Who's going to finance it? Subsidize it on a capital basis and finance it on a long-term basis. Uh, I don't know. The government programs, all the redevelopment agencies are gone. They've been put out of business. So I don't know where it's going. In the back. Are you? Yeah, uh, just one more, and if you could make it quick. Yeah. We've got about one or two minutes. Okay. okay. Just to elaborate on what he was concerned with, are you familiar with Jim Thomas's group, FAST? In my, in my career with Jim Thomas. Thomas. Yeah, he has the organization started. Yeah, I know, I know Tom, yeah, it was Thomas Properties, yes. Right, to address, the, it, he has an organization now, FAST? Yes. Okay. Yes, so that's does. something he or people in here may want yeah. to be involved in. I think it's called FAST, am I right? right. Yes, FAST. I just got involved in it. Yeah, Jim Thomas. Uh, former McGuire Thomas, Thomas Properties, another public company, private company that went public, New York Stock Exchange. And then sold out to, I think, another public company. Yeah, another public company. 
And by the way, there will be a lot of consolidation in the public company format, between public companies being bought. Thank you. Thank you.